A small, quiet, and friendly town with a population of 7,000 people was deeply shaken when an eight-year-old girl was found stabbed to death in her bedroom. Hi, 911. How can I help you? My children are at home alone, and a man just ran out of my house. My older son was in the bathroom, and my daughter started screaming. Okay. And when he came out, there was a man inside of my house. I need an officer there. Where, where, where is your house? The man is gone, though? Okay. Uh, they said he ran out, but they're okay. scared. I'm trying to... Of course. How old are your kids? Twelve and nine. Okay. So actually, you had a break-in. Yeah. Okay. Did they, did they see the man? Were they able to they, describe them? They did see him, yes. My daughter is freaking out right now. Okay. What's your own phone number? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll get somebody out there. I'm going to go ahead and call the house, okay? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. On April 27, 2013, 12-year-old Isaiah Fowler was at home with his 8-year-old sister, Leela Felder. She was in a room sleeping on the top bunk of her bed. Their father, Barney Fowler, and stepmom, Crystal Walter, were gone attending a Little League game. That afternoon, Isaiah went to the bathroom and that's when he heard his sister scream. Isaiah allegedly saw an intruder running out from the home's back door and then discovered his sister drenched in blood. She had sustained over 20 stab wounds. Isaiah quickly called 911. The parents immediately rushed home right before Leela could be taken to the hospital. Barney lifted her in his arms and could see the numerous wounds dotted across her body. The little bit I saw that nobody else saw, I won't talk about. He lifted her shirt and would later recollect seeing blood seeping out of her chest. I went in and carried my daughter's body out. I was going to take her to the hospital because I felt she was still alive. Young Layla was pronounced dead just six minutes after she arrived at the hospital. In a statement made to the police, Isaiah described the suspect as white or Hispanic male with a muscular build, about six feet tall, wearing a black long sleeve shirt and blue pants. He was also believed to have long gray hair. The gruesome murder of the eight-year-old sparked a massive manhunt in the Rancho Calaveras neighborhood of Valley Springs. Police officers from neighboring areas were also called in to help as authorities hunt down the suspect. Investigators collected fingerprints and DNA from the Fowler home. A handful of knives were discovered in the kitchen, and investigators removed them from the house to conduct forensic testing. They conducted a door-to-door -door sweep of homes in the area and searched storage sheds and horse stables. Divers were called in to search any local lakes and reservoirs. The Calaveras County Sheriff's Office spent more than 2,000 man-hours on the case, collecting evidence, interviewing people, and following up on leads. One neighbor said she spotted the suspect fleeing from the Fowler shortly after the 911 call. She later recanted her statement. During the composite sketch meeting, the witness recanted her previous statements and her identification of the man she saw running away. She also refused to provide a description to the sketch artist so that a composite could be completed. What was an important witness to the investigators was no longer credible. The news was not taken well by members of the community who have been living in fear. I was like, I was hoping they would have much more positive information for us. And I've got little children and I'm going to keep my doors locked and keep them safe. Another resident expressed his disappointment. It's disappointing. Uh, I thought that we were on the right path. It's a setback, but I trust the, uh, the Calaveras County Sheriff. Layla, was known for her sweet smile generous hugs, and friendly demeanor has hit the community hard. It does not happen to a person you know, much less a child you know. And this cannot happen to a child in your very own class. Part of the school-guided grieving process included classrooms taking turns writing notes to Leela and hanging them on the fence at the entrance to the school. They came in somber groups and attached their notes one by one. One student wrote, Dear Layla, you are a fun person and very smart. I enjoyed being around you every minute. Another student wrote, I know you were in heaven looking down at us, but you will always be in my heart. The Fowler family rallied together, donning t-shirts with photographs of Layla's smiling face plastered on the front. I just want to thank the entire community and all of our family and friends for the overwhelming amount of support that you've given my family. It will never be forgotten. They spoke to the media and urged anyone with any information to come forward. The small community of valleys gathered together with candles and sang to remember the eight-year-old girl. Isaiah was often at the forefront of these tearful gatherings. During one gathering, he said, I'm not saying goodbye to Layla. I'm saying see you later. There are no goodbyes. 
there were still no leads and still no clue who the killer was. However, neighbors in Valley Springs said that they feared all along that Layla's brother, not a mystery man the boy described, might be responsible for the girl's stabbing death. Within days, investigators noticed discrepancies between Isaiah's version of events and the evidence. According to investigators, it was evident that Layla had been stabbed to death while in her bunk but had somehow ended up across the floor. There were no bloody footprints indicating that she did not walk there herself. Furthermore, a steak knife was discovered and placed back in the kitchen drawer. This knife blade had been bent and contained traces of human blood. One neighbor said he did not see anybody enter or exit the Fowler home. Nobody came out that door, plain and simple. I got a German wolf, 95 pounds. Every time somebody walks down that street, they start barking. When this all happened, there was no barks. Nothing. Isaiah was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Violent crime was so rare in this community that even law enforcement officers had to stop and think when asked about the last time there was a stranger killing in the area. Isaiah's arrest came as a shock to the community. It was more shock than relief and sadness because it was actually the 12-year-old the, the who had started all this stuff and then people got angry with it and, uh, and then it just blew up. Isaiah firmly denied that he was involved in his sister's murder. His parents rallied around him and said they didn't believe he was guilty. His father, Barney, said, until they have proper evidence to show it's my son, we're standing behind him. During the murder trial, District Attorney Barbara Yook suggested that Isaiah had stabbed his sister to death before cleaning himself up and calling for help almost an hour later. Dr. Robert Lawrence testified that the injuries were mostly to her chest, but she had also suffered other injuries, including abrasions on her back. He described some of the wounds as prod injuries. At least 14 of them had been made by an object that she was poked with. Ultimately, Layla had died from shock and hemorrhaging. Bradley Swanson, assistant lab director of the California State Department of Justice, testified that a drop of blood had been discovered in the kitchen sink. Blood was also found on a door that connected the kitchen to the garage. Isaiah's defense team argued that investigators had botched the initial collection of evidence at the home and that the pathologist had conducted a lousy autopsy. They also argued that prosecutors had ignored the signs of an intruder and that they had rushed to judge Isaiah. In the closing arguments, the defense team said that the prosecution failed to offer a motive for the slaying adding it was unlikely that a 12-year-old boy would have enough criminal sophistication to clean a crime scene so well. In October 2015, the 12-year-old was ultimately found guilty of killing his 8-year-old sister. He was ordered to remain in custody at the OH Close Youth Correctional Facility until he turns 23 years old. The boy's father stormed out of the court when the verdict was read, while other family members shouted in disapproval. Barney Fowler told reporters after the verdict that he still believes his son did not kill his sister. They won, they started showing me this is what we have, this is what they had. I said, if you have evidence, arrest them. Here he is, but you have to convince me, and they still haven't done that. They manipulated and twisted everything to help benefit them, and there's plenty of proof and facts saying he didn't do it. The California Appellate Court reversed the ruling, saying two of Isaiah Fowler's interviews violated his rights. He didn't get an attorney, and he didn't get his Miranda rights. Instead, he got badgered by law enforcement who can, tried to convince him that they had proof that he had killed a sister when they didn't. The Fowler's family lawyer said that the DNA found on Layla was further proof that Isaiah did not kill his sister. So the DNA that was found on her body did not belong to our client. Anyone in his family, any of the law enforcement or first responders or crime scene technicians who were in the house, and no one who was in the federal database. However, Judge Susan Harlan, presiding over Fowler's retrial, reached the same conclusion of guilt as Judge Thomas Smith who oversaw Fowler's first trial. Harlan reiterated her certainty that Fowler is guilty. She said, there's no doubt you took the life of your sister. You did so viciously and used thought and planning. The victim was eight years old and would have expected her big brother to protect her and not take her life. Crystal Fowler, the stepmother of Isaiah and Layla, discusses the family's life since the day Layla was stabbed to death. So what have these last two and a half years been like since uh, he was convicted? Um. For us, it hasn't just been two and a half years, it's been over five years, because this started April 27, 2013, so it hasn't been any different for us. It's just as awful as it was the first two and a half years, it's been the last two and a half years. Having to get up there today, you kind of said that you've been sleepless, and uh, I mean, is that yeah. just like 
pulling this, a scab off of uh, right these moments um were not something that i ever wished to relive and um, it has been extremely hard for myself and my husband and my family and my other children um, having to go back through all of this again how do you do that i mean it's have four children at home still we don't really have a choice mm -hmm. and so those guys are what um, wakes us up every day and keeps us moving because what else are we going to do what was it like to hear i think it was in march or february that you had prevailed and he was going to have a new trial with? um i don't think he got a fair shake the first time around and so when the appeal was overturned and we knew we were coming back to trial um, it just felt like a step in the right direction. It was absolutely no victory or anything like that. It just felt like we were moving in the right direction. And um, figuring this out for him is ultimately what we need to do to figure it out for Layla, and that's why we're all here. In September 2021, Winnebago County Sheriff's Deputy Joshua Douglas responded to a call at 164 Van Buren Street in Thompson, only to find himself facing down a man with a gun taped to his hand. Dispatch. Yeah, this is Jim Ganner from Tom Sinewell. Yeah. Yeah, I got a, somebody was hit me just earlier. Somebody what? Hit me. Like an assault? Yeah. Okay, what's your name again, sir? Jim Ganderson. Anderson, I didn't catch your first name. James. James. Okay, what's your address, James? Yep. And a phone number? Who hit you? I don't know what his name was. Okay, where did it happen at? At my place. Okay. Do you need any medical assistance? No. Okay. And when did this happen? Just now. He left. Okay. In a vehicle or on foot? Uh, I In a vehicle, I believe. I didn't catch it, but yeah. Okay. But you don't know who it is? No. Okay. All right. I'll send a deputy over there. All right. Okay. Bye. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, James Anderson at said that he was just assaulted. Uh, the guy left in a vehicle. He said it happened in his house, but he doesn't know who the guy is. I'm sorry, I'm out. All right, thanks. Thank you, bud. Bye. 1033, 1032. Copy 8. Any officer in the Thompson area uh, from Winnebago County? On our 2 call 21, have an officer at an assault scene just called out an emergency 1032. Any officer that can respond advise Winnebago County. Winnebago, Cedar Falls on call 21. Go ahead, Cedar Falls. Uh, just checking, I've got a couple units en route from the post in Mason City. Do you have an address or a better location? Where the deputy is at right now. 10-4. Winnebago, go ahead. Were you able to copy any of the traffic I had with the deputy? Yes, we understand it was a fake assault call to lure the officer to the scene. That's correct. 10-4, we're monitoring TAC-22. All units have been invited to switch there. 95-4 has been advised, 95-1 is out of town. I have units from Winnebago County, Forest City, and Lake Mills en route. In route. Sir, drop the gun. I also have state patrol units en route from the post. 10-4, it was a fake, uh, fake assault call. Copy 8, were, was this call to lure you there? 10-4, what's your name, sir? What's your name? James Anderson. 95-8, uh, 41-8 is just coming into the south side of town. 10-4, he's getting close to his apartment now. 2-11 on scene. 
1926. What's up, Art? Undo your gun now. What about going to get shots fired? Happy shots fired at 1927. Responding agencies to Thompson, be advised. Officer advised shots have been fired. PD, I need your shield. James Anderson initially made a distressed call to 911, claiming that an assault took place at his home. The dispatcher asked Anderson to repeat his name, asked for his address, and sought additional details. Anderson was short on details. He claimed that he didn't know the person's name and he didn't know if they left on foot or in the car. When the sheriff got to the scene, Anderson was holding a loaded handgun. He told Sheriff Douglas that he called 911 as a ruse and there was no assault. Anderson refused to put down his weapon and the law enforcement on the scene negotiated with him for 10 minutes. When he pointed his gun at the sheriff, he was shot once and later died of his injuries. According to the Attorney General's report, Anderson asked Douglas to shoot him because he was suffering from an undisclosed medical issue. An examination of Anderson's cell phone done later by investigators finds messages from Anderson indicating he was suicidal. His family told the police he was recently diagnosed with a terminal illness and that he was devastated by the news. It took the Attorney General's office just 16 days to declare that the Sheriff's actions on September 11th were justified. At around 8.23 p.m., officers responded to the old Dixie Lodge to a report of a female who was not breathing. The woman's screams were reportedly ignored as her boyfriend beat her unconscious. Where is your emergency? She's not breathing. Please come here quickly. She's not breathing. Come on, come on, on quickly, come on. Sir, sir, stop yelling at me. Sir. City and what's you land, you land Florida, you land Florida, you land Florida. What's the nearest cross street, sir? What's the nearest what? What is the nearest cross street? Um, uh, Beardsford, Beardsford and um, Woodland. What's the room number? Uh, How old is this person? She's, she's like 26. Why is she not breathing? Did she take something? Uh, she was drinking alcohol. That's all that she was drinking alcohol. Is her she's chest not rising? breathing. Sir, stop what? yelling. Is her chest rising and falling? No, no, it's not. That's why I'm asking for y'all. Is she turning blue? Yes! Okay, are you willing to... Sir, stop yelling. Are you willing to start CPR? I've been trying. I've been putting into her mouth. I've been pumping your chest. Yes! Do you want yes, to any continue... Help. Listen to me. Do you want to continue CPR? What do you want me to do? Tell me what to do. Is she lying flat on her back? Yes. Yes, she is. Okay. I need you to put one of your hands in the center of her chest between her nipples, and I need you to put your other hand directly on top of that, okay? We're going to okay. do 30 compressions. You need to go at least two inches in depth, and we're going to go hard and fast, okay? We're going to do 30 compressions. I need you to count with me, okay? Okay, go! All right, one, two, one. three, count. four, five. Count with me, sir. Six. <laughs> Check for breathing, sir. Do you want to do breaths? Do not breathing. Do you want to do breaths? Tilt her head back so her airway is open and pinch her nose and give her two breaths. Baby, breathe, baby, breathe. Baby, breathe. She didn't take anything? No, 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 just alcohol, just alcohol. Okay. Let's start again, sir. One, two, three, One, four, two, five, three, four, seven. Five. Only two breaths, sir. Is she breathing? Sir, listen to me. Listen to me. My unit is almost there. Sir, do you want to keep doing compression? Okay. One. One. Two. Go faster. Sir, check for her breathing. Okay, I have. Listen. Listen, I have units on scene. Let's go again. Has she fallen? Sir, can you hear me?
When officers arrived, it became very apparent that the victim had been brutally beaten as she had severe swelling around her eyes, nose, left ear, and a laceration to her forehead. According to the investigators that were on the scene, um, her injuries were, were very disturbing. Detectives later found out she had multiple facial fractures as a result of the attack. The victim, identified as his 27-year-old girlfriend, Kimber Iverson, was revived and then transported to the hospital where she was put on life support. On Monday, December 9, 2019, Iverson succumbed to her injuries. An autopsy report revealed that the cause of death resulted from blunt force injuries to the head. Further investigations revealed that the injuries Iverson suffered resulted from her live-in boyfriend, Christopher Parker. During interviews, he provided inconsistent statements regarding what happened before law enforcement arrived. It was also determined that Parker made efforts to tamper with and clean up the crime scene. DeLand Police Chief Jason Umberger said his investigators are upset because witnesses heard Iverson screaming at the old Dixie Lodge 30 minutes before Parker called the police. None of the witnesses called 911, and one even chose to go to the grocery store so the person would not hear the screams. They just decided not to call. I think one uh, witness said that they just decided to leave and go to the grocery store or something rather than listen to, the, to the, what they heard. The chief said investigators suspect Parker hurt Iverson in the past. Though, DeLand doesn't have any previous domestic violence cases involving the couple. Umberger urged any domestic violence victims to contact a police advocate. Parker faces one count of first-degree murder, five counts of grand theft, and one count of aggravated battery. He was booked into the Volusia County Jail, where he was held without bond. Sixty-three-year-old Deborah Martell desperately crawled and yelled for help after getting shot in her leg at her North Naples apartment complex. Sorry, County 911. What is the address of the emergency? Uh, well, it's in my, it's my neighbor next door. She's in building, uh, she's been shot in the leg. Shot in the leg? Yeah, somebody across the lake shot her. Okay, what's the address, ma'am? It's, uh, what is it? Okay, stay on the line with me, okay, ma'am? All right, are you okay? Yeah, Okay. I see that. Some, somebody across the lake shot you. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, God, I see it. Yeah. Okay, you're saying it's... I'm not showing that, validating. What's the, uh, what's the building number? Why don't you... Uh, it's building... You can... Uh, I'm right next door. Just use my address then. Okay, ma'am. Okay, are you with the neighbor now or no? Yeah, yeah, I'm helping her to get up here. Okay, is she bleeding? Okay. Yes, it's bleeding. Okay, is there any way you can control the bleeding? Oh my God, there's bullets right there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get something. Okay, where is the suspect that shot her? Uh, it's on her lower left uh, leg. No, where did the suspect go? The person I shot don't know, it's across the lake. She didn't see who did it. I just heard it in my leg. I heard the gunfire, but I thought it was a backfire for the car. Ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Oh, be careful. How long ago did this happen? Uh, this is five minutes ago. I heard a scream. Oh, man. And I ran out my front door. Okay, where are the yeah. injuries? Pardon? Where are the injuries? The injuries? It's a lower left leg. Lower left leg? Yeah, I know, honey. Calm down. I know, but I got diabetes. Calm. I have you. I know. I got all kinds of problems. Patient, she has diabetes? Yes, yes she does. Okay, is there any way we can control the bleeding? I am, uh, let me see what I have. Can you, okay. get, can you get a clean or dry cloth and press down on the wound? Uh, well, the bullet's like right there. I just don't want her to bleed out, ma'am. Let me see what I can get. Okay, ma'am. Do you see any suspicious persons in the area? No, I know we got the lawn service here, so. But, like, where the noise was coming from, did you see any, like, a group of people or somebody no. over there? No, I did not. Okay, where exactly is it from your apartment? Uh, it's right across the lake. We have, like, a man-made lake with the water fountain. Okay. Is it the side closest to Pine Ridge or where? Here, we got it. 
Martell recounted the shooting and said she wasn't certain where the random bullet came from. Things started simply at about 11.40 a.m., just after Martell fed her dog. She went out of the apartment where she had been living for two months to walk her dog midnight. She remembered she was looking at a landscaper who was working. Right as the lawman passed the one building, um, I heard a shot and the dog panicked so I let go of him so he could run towards the door and the bullet hit me in the leg and then I looked down and saw the blood and knew I was shot. Martell followed, sat down outside her home and pressed on the wound to stop bleeding. She could see the bullet sticking out of her skin. It had entered on the side of her leg inches below her knee. A neighbor heard her and helped her stop the bleeding with a towel. Martell was taken to the hospital, her injury was wrapped, and she was immediately discharged. She now walks slowly with the help of crutches and sometimes moves within the apartment with the help of an office chair on wheels. Some residents say they're also scared to walk their dogs around the complex, not knowing where the bullet came from and who the shooter is. Martell expressed her concerns over her health. She has diabetes and had a liver transplant eight years ago so her immune system is weak. She said, I had a flash that I would lose my leg. Regardless of this incident, she says she was happy to be alive. The Collier County Sheriff's Office searched the apartment complex after the woman was shot, but Captain Efrain Hernandez said that no suspect was located. In October 2011, five-year-old Emilia Kegley was looking for her mother, backed a car out of the driveway, then called 911 for help. 911, your emergency. Um, my mom's car backed 
now I'm actually in the need of police to pull my mom's car back in. Everywhere when I got off the bus, but my mom wasn't here. And I miss you so much. It's all right, honey. Mom's going to come back. Mom probably went looking for you. Worried that her mother was at home, Emilia decided to look for her, starting her mother's 1999 Lincoln Navigator. It backed down the sloped driveway and came to a stop on the grass across the street. The young girl then dialed 911, explained the situation, and asked for quick help getting the car back home because she said her mom would be upset with her. She didn't want to admit she was behind the wheel. Officer Ryan Grimshaw said he responded to the house to find the SUD had rolled backward out of the driveway, across the street, and into a neighbor's yard. He said, you could tell that she followed exactly probably what her mom does when she gets in the car. She put the keys in the ignition, pulled it into drive, turned the headlights on, like she was ready to drive somewhere, like she was grown up. Police eventually managed to reach the girl's parents and sort out the confusion. No charges were filed. For more True 911, watch this episode next. You can also let me know which call was your favorite in the comments below.